much. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, Kalantara Clinical Society uh, for giving the SLMA a chance to collaborate with you all and also the University of Huddersfield. They have been our long standing partners. Uh, even last year, we have a great partnership for our Congress. Thank you very much for all those who uh, contributed to this effort, uh, multi stakeholder effort that really yield results, no doubt. Uh, so, uh, I think we had uh, pretty comprehensive two lectures on the disaster ecosystem in a global context as well as uh, from a Sri Lankan context as well. Now, my and uh, Dr. Chinta's uh, uh, talk today will focus on particularly on hospital settings, right? ABCs of hospital disaster preparedness. Now, as clinicians and also as uh, public health uh, practitioners, uh, we think like hospitals are safe havens, right? Safe havens for patients as well as safe havens for doctors and all other healthcare workers. Now, that has been the uh, perception of all of us for some time. But now, since lately, uh, this whole safe haven and the safety of a hospital concept has been changed. Now, I have included here four pictures. Can you identify, since now you had the morning refreshments, I think you can uh, sort of energize as well. So, any one of you can identify one of the pictures? I heard one earlier. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, on the left hand corner, top of your uh, uh, picture is the uh, the event that happened in 2020, if I'm not mistaken, in Beirut, Lebanon. There was a huge explosion, uh, uh, ammonia nitrate uh, uh, first plant exploded. Around 230 people died with unimaginable destruction to properties, right? So it was considered to be a localized uh, explosion, but the ramifications and the consequences were sort of uh, very large, extensive. So that was the epicenter. The, the tall building is the epicenter of that blast. And two to three minutes after the blast, the initial response, this is the closest hospital to the Beirut blast. In your right hand side, on top corner, that is the closest hospital to the Beirut blast. You can clearly see the hospital infrastructure has been damaged as well, right? But the people are working. Doctors, nurses, and all other healthcare providers are uh, doing their maximum to treat for the patients. So those are the typical scenarios that we can expect in future as well as under current circumstances. Don't think that Sri Lanka is immune to such disasters because following this disaster, uh, when we actually after two months of this disaster, we had a similar desktop drill to envision a similar kind of uh, explosion in Gwonpot and also in Karambopo, because we do have such facilities in our homes, right? Imagine the situation if we have a, such a blast and the patients come into the ETU of the NHS, right? So then those are the situations that we have to envision in future. On the bottom left hand, you have the largest hospital in Gaza Strip. I don't have to remind uh, the situation there. So if you can see, the tents in front of the hospital are the displaced people from elsewhere. So people are traveling from all around the Gaza Strip to this particular hospital. Why? The hospital is considered as a safe haven. They think like hospital will never get attacked. Hospital will never get bombed. No one will uh, intrude into the hospital, right? So it's a safe thing. But see the next picture, what has happened. This is after two days of this picture. So the entire hospital got dead. Healthcare workers died, including doctors and nurses. And as of uh, some of the data from global organizations, uh, 17 attacks, 17 attacks per day happening in Gaza Strip for healthcare institutions 
in the healthcare institutions. So that is the situation that the current circumstances have led us. So hospitals are no longer considered as safe havens, even though we have been taught in the medical school and in our postgraduate curricula that hospitals are safe and uh, there is no no one above the hospitals or healthcare facilities, right? So this is the uh, current situation. Now this is much closer to home. Anyone can identify any of the pictures? Some of our senior colleagues most probably can identify, and also juniors. Anyone who has worked in uh, Mahamudan, teaching us with Mahamudan? So that picture of the right uh, water corner is Mahamodara Teaching Hospital in 2017. What is the situation? 2017. That is the largest daily epidemic that we have faced. Around 438 fatalities, 186,000 cases. So this is the Mahamodara Hospital. You can see how many patients per bed and under the bed. You can see the patients under the bed. Right? So this is Mahamodara Hospital, teaching hospital, one of the largest hospitals in the country during the outbreak of Delhi. And on your uh, left hand bottom, you have a fire. This is in 2014, actually. This is the first time where a MRI machine was uh, uh, installed in uh, DGH Nigam, District General Hospital Nigam. And while doing the uh, wiring and all, there was a sudden fire. Entire flow got engulfed in the fire. Luckily, there were no fatalities, there were no injuries, but the hospital authorities has to move the entire fire brigade and the uh, uh, urban loss in. Uh, Nikampo as well as from the uh, Kalamu police stations as well. So that is the situation in a local hospital. Because PGH Nikampo I think uh, around 600 to 1000 beds. Right? On left hand side on your top of your picture, that is more recent. Have you noticed anything peculiar? No, they are not swimming, but they are they are in flux. This is teaching hospital Jeff. Few months back. But they they are still working. So that, that is the resilient of healthcare workers. But you see how we are sort of vulnerable, right? For a very minor plan. It's not a major plan. It's a minor plan. So hospital inside the hospital. It's a uh, inundator, but they're still working. Right? On uh, right hand top, you have the motion during COVID 19. So I don't need to mention you, most of you have worked during the COVID 19 outbreak. So this is the situation. Our motion capacities have exceeded. We have to sort of put bodies in corridors. Sometimes even in hospital corridors. So that is the situation. So even in global context and also in a Sri Lankan context, hospitals are vulnerable to various kinds of disasters. Right? So don't ever think like if you are working in a hospital that we are immune to uh, external hazards and internal hazards. Right. Now, hospitals are vulnerable mainly because of two factors. One, external hazards, as I told you, it can be floods, it can be uh, landslides, it can be uh, civil unrest, war, right? And also from internal hazards. This is uh, three weeks back at the National Hospital. The picture on the right, you might be experiencing similar situations more frequently as well. Right? So internally, it can be building collapses, fire, and also create union action. Right? So those are 
the uh, vulnerabilities that as doctors, as nurses, and as self care workers we face on a daily basis. So, hospitals are vulnerable due to external hazards or due to internal hazards. That is uh, Kilmia, uh, the DH, the Asian hospital in Kilmia, following the tsunami. Anyone have worked in the, those areas during the tsunami? I think that, yeah. So, that is Kilmia hospital following the tsunami. Look at the description. Right? That is an external hazard. We don't have the uh, sort of capacity to control that. But some of these uh, internal assets we can't control, but we can't mitigate. We can mitigate, right? We can mitigate the risk. We can mitigate the impact of these assets, right? So now hospitals are vulnerable due to some of their particular characteristics. Now, if if it comes to a hospital, they are vulnerable in three ways. One, structure, right? Why structurally? Because now, if you can remember, if anyone who has been transferred out and transferred in again to Kalutra Hospital, uh, you can imagine the number of buildings that have been put up in Kalutra. Yes, we need uh, expansion of space to accommodate more patients, to accommodate more doctors, to accommodate more health staff. But Given the way that we build hospitals, given the way that we build different units, uh, 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 different substitution entities coming into the hospital, and we need to have a different space, right? So there is some haphazard building as well. So structurally, most of our hospitals, right? Believe me, we have uh, done the WHO assessment for the safe hospital initiative a few years back. Uh, covering many base hospitals and some of the DGHS, most of them, the buildings in most of them are not structurally sound. Right? So, structurally, due to defects in structural integrity, weight bearing, foundation, pillars, right? Even in this building, I can see some of the defects, right? If you are trained, I, not medical professionals, but engineers, they will definitely tell. Why this building is not a structure in sound really, right? So there can be structural defects. And they non-structure. Non-structural in the sense the architectural elements, the way they have installed the, the door panels, the way they have installed the window panels, right? Then equipment and lifelines. Now lifelines are very important. For example, the gas, gasoline, the water. Electricity, when it comes to uh, uh, ICU care, right? These lifelines are very important. So, in that aspect, also, you can be vulnerable. Then, the most important thing functional. Functionally, you can be vulnerable due to lack of maintenance, right? We include different, different units, we include different, different equipments to the hospital, but when, when you come back and see after three years, you are requesting the same equipment. That is mainly because of maintenance and lack of maintenance of life. And also human performance. Now, this functional category includes us, the doctors, nurses, and other healthcare workers. So, a hospital can be vulnerable under these three categories. Now, the picture shows. A hospital following the uh, major uh, earthquake in Haiti. So that is what left of a hospital. That is because the hospital is not that structurally sound, right? So even a minor uh, earthquake that can fail. I can very well remember in 2017 during the floods in the southern province uh, in uh, DH in the Division Hospital, we have to search for the ambulance following the flood. It has been washed up. Ambulance was sort of uh, found uh, around one and a half kilometers away, right? And within the labor room, uh, there is around six feet of water. The entire equipment, all the labor room equipment was washed up. So that is the situation. So you can be structurally, non structurally, and functionally one. And also, there are particular incidences that hospital can be vulnerable as well. 
mass casualty incidents, right? When it comes to mass casualty incidents, I think that the emergency consumption index will uh, highlight more on that. The three things, right? Three ten transfer. Those are the sense of mass casualty incidents. But during a mass casualty incident, even if we are a teaching hospital, even if we are the national hospital, we can do one. For example, I don't know whether Dr. Sandy has been there during the uh, Easter Day in the uh, So even we had the uh, most trained, qualified professionals there, all the equipment, cyber equipment, there was sort of kind of one. Why? The triage, there were for one patient, there were around 20 25 doctors. Because they were they were coming to help. That is good. That is a good intention. But during a mass casualty event, it is not the good intentions that save the life of the patient. It is the evidence-based practice, it is the uh, criteria that we have put on, it is the drills that we have done, it is the practice that saves the patient. Right? So during a mass casualty incident, any hospital can be one. Now there's another term called PICE, P -I -C -E, that is potentially injury creating events, right? Any event where we can expect additional casualties. Now suppose you are getting a news from the uh, highway that the bus has left with an accident and casualties are coming to the emergency equipment unit, right? So in the first wave, we expect four or five people. But suddenly, the second wave, you are getting around 30 to 40 casualties. So additional casualties, right? There will be a disruption of resources as well. Suppose it happened in a night, ETU shift, I think most probably two doctors here for the ETU at night, right? So imagine around uh, 80 to 90 patients coming at once during an accident in the uh, highway, you can't fall. There will be disruption of this service, right? That is why it is important that we train our people and we, we always anticipate there can be an emergency and there can be an accident, right? So that is potentially injury creating event parts. Then mass gatherings. Normally, the, the definition of mass gathering is more than 1,000 people at, at a given time. Since you have uh, many shrines in the Kaluga region, you have the famous Buddhist shrines, the Catholic shrines, right? Any moment during a festival, you can have more than 1,000 people. Mass gatherings. Injury can happen, illness can happen, infectious disease outbreaks can happen, even spread as well, right? So, mass gatherings. Then, disease outbreaks. And the latest is CDR gatherings. Now, what is CDR? C is for chemical, B is for biological, N, R for radiological, N for nuclear. Don't ever think that since we don't have any nuclear plants in our wildest dreams for another 20 or 30 years, we are not immune to any nuclear accident. Because from MANA, just around 30 kilometers away, we have the Kudakulam nuclear power of India. Any nuclear leakage, any accident, will definitely affect us as well. Because of the wind patterns and because of the uh, close distance. Chemical, we can have it at any day. If you can remember a few years back, at uh, BH Corona, they had people drowned into this uh, Rubber treatment uh, facility, they have the they have the issue, right? Biological, it can be from external sources, it can be from within the hospital as well. Imagine a multi drug resistant pathogen spreading around in ICUs, in ICUs, and within the hospital. It will be a major event that needs external help as well. Nuclear or at all. Radiological, yes, the radiological source in the radiology department. I don't know whether we are doing any, I think we are doing just it's a general hospital, teaching hospital. So there is this uh, radiological uh, equipment and sources that can be sort of a potential threat as well. For example, in some of these cancer hospitals, so in uh, example in Apexia or in Northern Province, the cancer hospital. 
there can be leaky of this as well. Ready, right? So these are the uh, events that hospitals are vulnerable. These are not the entire list, but these are some of these events that hospitals are vulnerable that you have to uh, be careful of. Right. Now, what are the consequences? Structural and functional damages that we can repair. Even if we don't have money, we can get a loan and we can repair. That's what we are doing now. But Structural and functional damages, credit lines, loans, we can repair. Service interruption, there will be much more damage. For the people, because of increased mortality and mobility, and also depletion of trust. Now, people see hospitals as a civil failure. People see hospitals as a caregiver. So if we can't sort of provide these services without interruption, even amidst disasters, even amidst crisis, they will fail. Like we have failed in our job. So the trust towards healthcare workers and health system is of paramount importance. Now, if we are failing to provide an uninterrupted service, that means the trust that they have put on our, ourselves is being reduced by the day. Then the collapse of the health system, that we can have different definitions, but during history we have sometimes, we were on the verge of a possible collapse, but we somehow, through the efforts of healthcare workers uh, and all the people, we have averted. Now, the topmost picture is one of the consequences. That is uh, in Syria. See how the entire hospital and the ambulances transporting patients have been attacked and destroyed. And this one, the bottom one, is from your very district, Hunter district, 2017. Uh, this, this is, if uh, I'm not mistaken, this is Bulat Moich, one of the uh, PHM uh, uh, officers following floods. See the destruction. So, those are the consequences of hospitals or so our public health institutions be vulnerable to different kinds of disasters. So, we have to be prepared. Right. So, how do we prepare? I think uh, Dr. Chita will uh, update you how we can prepare. I'll just go through the uh, some of the main topics. Hospital risk assessment, she will uh, elaborate on it. Then HICS, hospital incident command structure, very important for a teaching hospital and uh, general hospital. Regular desk reviews and simulations and drills. Search capacity assessment, that is also important since this is a tertiary care hospital and a referral hospital to many hospitals in the district. Contingency planning. On-site medical care and mini hospital care, evacuation and relocation. Evacuation in the sense, not a particular unit, but also sometimes entire hospital. Imagine a disaster like tsunami that we have to evacuate the entire hospital, relocate the entire hospital, right? So relocation might take time. For example, the Mahamodra Teaching Hospital was relocated last week I am not mistaken through the Helmut call uh, for new hospital. So relocation might take some time, but evacuation, a definite yes, evacuations can happen at any time. So these are the possible uh, mechanisms that we have and we have to install to sort of prevent any disasters, hospital risk assessment, incident command structure, surgical capacity assessment, contingency planning. Okay, I'll hand over to uh, Dr. Chita. She will explain how you, as a hospital, can do the hospital risk assessment and be prepared for any eventualities that I have mentioned. 